Bruins. This is episode 122 of the American Muslim Experience. I am Pervez Ahmed, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Omar Ansari. Salam like Pervez, Salam like listeners. Hope everybody's doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's been a hot minute. Uh, pretty hot, too, actually. We are undergoing a pretty intensive heat wave. Um, and so, um, yeah, but we're here in the Bay, so I can't complain too much, although we are hitting triple digits even out here in Northern California. You know, I'm smiling because you you said it's been a minute. You know, I don't think I've gotten that whole lingo down. It's it's. I'm still just so behind the times. Was, we were just laughing. I feel uh, a sense of accomplishment that I told you what mid the usage of the term mid. I, I got I got points with my with my 15 year old because I knew it because she had also just discovered it a little late for, relative to her friends and then I was like oh yeah I know what mid means and she was all surprised so so I guess I owe you one. Yeah, that's right. I'm still <laughs> learning all that. I, I, I'm so behind. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we we we're that we're, we're that generation that, especially I think as we get older, we're becoming more like our like the like our our, our parents and, and and the boomer generation than we are, uh, you know, uh, connected with the young folks. So yeah, definitely un- un- uncles, uncles, we, totally. We, my uh, my friends and I sometimes we joke. It's it's uh, like we're becoming uncles. It's the process of uncleization. Uncleization. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Right. Uh, yeah, we we need to start using it's like that. fermentation, uncleization, right? <laughs> With the, but but with that uncleization comes wisdom. With that uncleization comes hopefully some insight. So, yeah, so I mean, all due respect to yeah, the uncles out yeah, there, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but I will say, you know, like you kind of not so in jest or in joke, but um, you know, like you live long enough and you begin to see things, crip, you know, cro- uh, uh, cropping up in the Muslim community. And right now we're recording just to kind of situate ourselves, like we're on the. There's been a lot of conversations online about um, another sort of Muslim leader, Muslim uh, faith leader who has been accused of abuse, spiritual abuse, which is a term I know we've talked about on the show in the past. And and, and there's a lot to uncover there. And I, so I, I, I always I dislike, you know, salaciously dropping something. But, you know, it, it is our hope. I think Omar and, and Omar and I both have talked about this to, to have a guest on and we can sort of have a meaningful conversation around how the Muslim community is, um, you know, hopefully doing a better job than it's done in the past of holding leadership accountable. You know, what is the sort of right balance between holding leadership accountable and then not get into the sort of whole cancel culture, which it, I know that in and of itself is a loaded term, but, you know, sort of that balance, if you will. And as someone who was involved with a, non, a, a Muslim nonprofit that had its own share of controversies and and dealing with again accusations of spiritual abuse against uh, its leader um you know I, I take this very seriously and so it's something that it's a conversation that we uh, that I know we want to have yeah yeah we've talked a little about it um I know there's some organizations that are doing some work to to move things forward in a, pro- in a positive way so right. that would definitely be an interesting uh topic for a future episode uh, and I know there's a bunch of other stuff that we're, we've been wanting you know, to, to talk about on the yeah, show. Just exactly. haven't had the time because, you know, when did, when were we last on the show in April? And then yeah. uh, Ramadan, Eid, and then just summer, right? And Some, life, yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, I mean, you, you know, exactly. I mean, I think if it was just up to us, the two of us, without having to have a guest on or what have you, we'd probably sit on a mic at least once a week and just kind of talk about, you know, what's what's in the news but i know we i know our listeners like to have you know us sit with other people as well so it's that balance of wanting to get on a mic and sort of opine or talk about what's in the news and at the same time you know a schedule uh, a nice guest so it's, the, it's we've always sort of struck we've always tried to hopefully strike uh, an appropriate balance between those those two things but as a result of the fact that we do like to schedule guests and hopefully have meaningful conversations we don't get to talk about the topic of the day or, or the news of the day and the news of the moment. So you have to excuse us for that. But, uh, but uh, I mean, speaking of summer, though, I mean, what are, I know we've got some summer plans, both of us. Yeah, yeah. Busy summer. Um, I'm, I think it's a, it's a trend out there. A lot of people are traveling again. It's, it's expensive, right, with all the inflation. But people are just saying, forget it. I, I'm going to pay whatever it is and, yeah. and do something, whether it's a road trip or, uh, or whatever it is, Pe- people are trying to hit the road, and and yeah, it's the same situation here. Uh, it's a busy summer, going to see family, going to going to a wedding, a family wedding. Uh, we both are uh, also doing some small trips here, or there, like Disneyland, and yeah, uh, maybe even even Vegas or something like that, just yes. for a weekend, just to get out, get away. 
Yeah, that's right. And and then something we've talked about, um, we're going to be returning to Michigan. Well, well, not well, I should say I'm returning to Michigan. You are going to Michigan. We're going together for a for our nieces, uh, Walima. So that's going to be in July. I doubt we'll get any content recorded, although I'm always I've got the itch to try to schedule time and carry this little, um, you know, mobile um, studio we've got going here, but we're not gonna have the time to sit with someone. But Anyway, we're coming back to Michigan. So for those listeners out there, hopefully I'll get to cross paths with some of my old friends and people, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that we've connected with. Uh, but uh, have you ever been to Michigan? Uh, I have. I've okay. been a couple of times, uh, once as a kid to visit relatives, okay. our mutual relatives. Um, and then I went a couple of years ago for a friend's wedding. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Was that in Dearborn? It was in Dearborn. Okay. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Ali Arati, founder of Tonal, as some of you may know. Speaking so. of summer and getting into that summer body shape, right? Oh <laughs> so man, to- I, I wish, I wish that has, yeah, that has not happened. <laughs> you, I'm, I'm, you can't pull the like, fan, like the friend hookup and get one installed in your house <laughs> for a premium. No. Man, I, I, I need to. It's, it's definitely been, it's definitely been, uh, it's uh, you know, with, with, with uh, getting out again and going to restaurants again and, and going back to work again, and they're feeding us to get us to get in, go into the office and, and. and yeah, so I think a tonal sounds about about right. <laughs> That's right, um, and and hopefully something else we'll get to, which is something you and I have talked about, which is actually take the show on the road, you and I. And uh, you know, um, I, I took the show once on the road when we went to Michigan. Speaking of Michigan, but um, also looking forward to maybe a possible trip down to Southern California. Uh, have a little R and R for both of us, and just kind of just yeah, kind of boys relax. trip, boys trip. That's yep, right. Yeah, because uh, uh, when we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll c- c- catch that weekend where both families are out, and so we are. We'll hit the road, maybe maybe uh, visit some folks, and even record a bit if possible. That's right. So a little, a little tease there. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to uh, record in person with some folks in Southern California. So, um, but uh, yeah, there's there's that of course, and then uh, in the midst of all that, try to absorb and take in as much content as we can get our hands on, and. As as die in the wool, um, die hard Star Wars fans as we are, we are also sitting here today, recording uh, the day after the last episode of Obi Wan Kenobi dropped. <laughs> and I don't know anything about Omer's thoughts. Yeah, um, we've touched a little bit about the show. You and I saw saw the first show together. Yeah, but after that, I think I don't think you and I have really spoken about the show. So I'm really excited to hear your thoughts, and then I'll share mine. Yeah, for sure. I, well. It's, kind of a, a preface as I was mentioning we're going back into the office and oh, this week especially right. had to yeah. go in for like I don't know the full day I mean it was an off-site uh where people flew in from all over the world co-workers that I've been working with over zoom for you know months and months but never met finally met this week how was that that must have been nice yeah it was fun it was yeah. fun yeah we but uh you know because people flew in from all over the world it meant yes. not just a full day but staying for dinner so I had three three straight days of that, but then I got home like seven forty five today, and I'm like, okay, what am I doing first? Uh, I'm going to pop in some Obi Wan and, and watch the finale just to decompress from all that work. Uh, so I watched it, and I knew you were coming over, and I'm like, okay, I got an hour. I'm going to watch it. Good, good uh, so for that, you. That was that was a lot of fun. I I I loved it. I mean, I thought it was phenomenal. Um, it was just a perfect uh, segue between you know Revenge of the Sith and, and New Hope. It felt like a movie, to be honest. Mm. The only thing I would say was I would have enjoyed watching it like a movie without okay. all the breaks, yeah. um, because it was so cinematic. Right. But the the breaks every week kind of took you out of that that flow. Right. It felt more like a movie than a show. But hey, I'm not complaining about six hours of of Obi Wan Kenobi. So. Obi Wan Kenobi yeah. facing off against Vader. Yeah. Um, and Definitely some... felt like a kid for sure watching <laughs> that. That was great. <laughs> I, so so my thoughts are probably a little bit less enthusiastic than yours. Um, I felt I, I agree with you about the cinematic nature of, of 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 the show, and I did feel like the good parts were like a great movie. Mm-hmm. And but I feel like in addition to this great movie, which would have been the Obi Wan Kenobi Darth Vader slash Anakin Skywalker story, they include they uh, what's the word they included a. a I guess they they explored an area that would have been a great show in and of itself, and that I mean by the the, the Inquisitors. Hmm. I felt like they could have done like a separate storyline with the Inquisitors, you know, searching the galaxy for fugitive runaway Jedi's, mm-hmm. including even Obi Wan Kenobi, because he's one of the few that are alive that they know of. Um, and that would have been like a separate series, and then the Obi Wan Kenobi, and then the face off with Vader. 
and where we left off with episode three slash Revenge of the Sith and then where we know that they're going to end up in episode four when they face off with one another. Uh, I thought they could have just done that as like a movie even, but, um, and which was, uh, to be fair, that was the original idea, right? But then they got, I think they got scared after Solo flopped. Yeah. And then they backed off of that idea of making Kenobi a movie. Right. So what do you think about that? I mean, you know, like the Inquisitor storyline being something that was almost like a B story. Yeah. That that could have been explored, you know, by as a separate show. And notwithstanding all the hate that the character Reva got and the actress unfortunately got all that. And some of it was race and race based and just ugly social media, ugly. I thought overall her arc was a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and there were some, I think they included those characters because there were some parallels Okay. In between the main characters and those new characters. True, right? true, so, true. Oh, I see what you mean. Right, right, right. right. I don't want to spoil it. Spoil for this, it. But there's a, there's a few parallels between yeah. that new character and Anakin Skywalker right. in, yeah. a, in a way, right? Yeah. Choices, um, choices made, if you will. And I think if we're talking about Star Wars and if we're talking about Disney, we'd be remiss not to talk about the technology because I think the special effects were amazing, as yeah. always. And that's, I think, added to the sort of cinematic nature of it. What I love about Disney Plus is it actually offers something, um, for example, Ms. Marvel, you can do with the family. I mean, there's just not a lot of, uh, there's not a, a lot of shows that you can watch with the family, but Disney Plus, I think it's, a, it's good overall. You know, I mean, you, there's always the criticisms of Disney, uh, but I mean, Ms. Marvel, great show to watch with the family, right? Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to talk about Ms. Marvel for a little bit. I mean, we're only on episode two. I think both of us have, have not watched the third episode, which just dropped yesterday. Um, you know, speaking of that too much too much content out there but um it, i agree with you it's a great show with the family i mean and frankly i, I watched w1 with the one daughter of mine who is a star wars fan <laughs> and she enjoyed it because she loves darth vader so um but yeah sorry going back to the technology piece uh, you know the volume right sorry the, the volume the, yeah. for sure so that's the odd uh, the the video uh, i guess the visual sorry the visuals but i thought what was amazing was um darth vader's voice i mean mm. they 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 credit uh, James Earl Jones, but I don't think it was actually Jim, James Earl Jones because he's now 90 plus, I think, and he would have sounded a lot more like Rogue One, but mm. he literally sounds like he did in like Empire Strikes Back or yeah. Return of the Jedi. So what they do is right. they basically feed uh, all his old recordings into... Circa that time right. period. And then they use yeah. our computers to output what they want them to say. And it's a, it's very similar to the uh, deep fake technology where they feed in all the f- pictures of somebody's face. Mm. And um, and then they can use all that library in the new footage and th- th- you know, find the angle that matches the angle they're trying to use. Amazing. And that's probably... that. Honestly, that's a whole show in and of itself, just the implications of technology and oh, it is. And um, that's a great idea, mis, actually. You know, misuse of technology right. for for nefarious purposes or intentions, right? right. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I don't think this would be a teaser to say, but I think they did the same thing with Mark Hamill. Um, you know, mm-hmm. when they did um, not Mandalorian, but his appearance in uh, Boba Fett. Yeah, where but, they they didn't. It wasn't his voice now, Mark Hamill, but right. it was Mark Hamill. That's from right. video clips, audio clips, interviews, and of course the movies from that time period. Yeah. And then you've got this sort of AI that you can now recreate in brand new dialogue. Yeah. Deep. Like I was thinking about this, like, uh, you know, one of the things Vader keeps saying youngling, and I don't think he ever says the word youngling from back in the day, but it was probably like him saying young, mm-hmm. right? And then, I don't yeah, know. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's amazing. The, it's amazing. The other thing that's just amazing. Right. And, and I think of it as I watch these new shows is the whole concept of the volume. So I don't know if uh, for listeners. Yeah, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So they used to do all the technology on a green screen. And now uh, what Disney pioneered and they pioneered it for the first time with the show, The Mandalorian, it's essentially like a massive, massive uh, LED screen. Right. And instead of standing in front of, of a green screen, they actually stand in front of this tv led screen that's right that has the images that they want to um, record on so mm. for example if they're recording in desert it'll have images of a desert and and what that does it actually provides through the screen then the lighting that mimics that atmosphere exactly. so it's super super no it's so amazing another movie that was filmed uh using that technology was the batman I didn't oh, know. I didn't know that. Really? Yeah, I didn't know. Don't know it's filmed with that technology, but they use they use that technology, uh, the volume, um, and basically you can be in any atmosphere, yeah. any location. You don't need to fly to 
uh, Tunisia anymore to be in the desert, right? You can basically just That's be right. on Tatooine right. when you're actually in and your... if you want, if you want Tatooine at sunset, you can, yeah, you know, you can show that in the back in the mm -hmm. background, and then in the foreground. What I also appreciate as a guy who likes practical effects is that in the foreground you can have your practical effects yeah. and your practical sorry your practical props and things like that that the characters are interacting with but in the but in the background you've got this yeah yeah not it's, instead of a matte painting like from the 1930s you actually now have this ability to create a real three-dimensional background right. it's amazing and the back the, yeah. the, the 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 image can move right so it looks like the actor's moving or like for example in the batman the whole car chase is filmed oh. using the volume so the car is sitting there on the set right. and the screen is moving but it, it mimics the uh, car chase that's amazing yeah and that's this amazing. this technology so they, they start yeah. out with one of these volumes right and now there's like four in the world. Yeah, yeah. And Dis Disney and John Favreau pioneered it, and and they're and it's it's like the new way to do right. uh, onset, you know, mimic Phenomenal. mimic uh, locations and whatnot. Yeah. Well, I will say, like, so it's like j j just to sort of put a pin in our conversation around the uh, around Kenobi. Um, you know, overall, love the show and uh, looking forward to additional content. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, more Star Wars is always a, a fun way to just you know be taken back to to childhood. Absolutely, absolutely, man. So, um, yeah. Speaking of content and uh, oh yeah, so we, I, like Miss Marvel, like I said, too or too early to tell. What I've seen so far, I really like. I know it's 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 it's. Uh, um, you know, it's engendered a lot of conversation online mm -hmm. among, you know, would-be critics and as well as just average Joe Schmo Muslims trying to watch the content. And, you know, is it good? Is it positive representation? Is it negative representation? Is it not good? Is it... Well, so I think it's just too early to tell. I will say two episodes in, I like it so far. I think it's, it's yeah, great. There's I'm, a lot of, I mean, it's it's, it's accurate. It's... Uh, it doesn't just gloss over that part of her her personality or her who she is. It it, it goes all in on yeah. like the it's very Muslim Muslimy if you yeah, will. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. And um, she's it's not like they're showing a liberal family or a super conservative. It's just kind of a, a average Pakistani family from Jersey, right? They're not super. They're not like super conservative. Um, they're not super liberal right they're Which, kind of just in right, the middle that's, that's the vast majority of the muslim yeah. community so i you know in terms of representation i mean to me it's spot on you know yeah. in terms of what the majority of families look like yeah i mean um, if you're looking for you know representation with you know the entire although every single muslim female carrying wearing character wearing hijab and you know all the Per, you know all the all, men are yeah. practiced like you know beard yeah. beard wearing you know yeah cons what, yeah whatever that looks like there's um, there's a scene yeah. in, for example in the latest episode uh -huh. um where they're at, well, a, latest at a wedding episode, two. episode three which, oh, which three. i haven't fully watched but i saw some clips okay where it's a wedding okay and they're dancing and and you know there's some people in the muslim community who would object to that so but at the same time it's not it's not as if that's not authentic exactly it actually does it's represent a, some families right. right it's not a hollywood portrayal of a muslim family yeah. or or muslim community it is um a a glimpse of many muslim communities yeah. or not, hollywood or all. even or even a caricature like yeah. the the you know they're super uh, ultra conservative you know or even conservative right absolutely like by the book if you mm -hmm, will mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean because to be fair it's either that kind of portrayal we've seen a lot of or we see the portrayal where it's something to do with national security and mm -hmm. you know that whole in the national security apparatus and the patriotic muslim versus the fundamentalist muslim you have none of that here no. at least so far so i i really appreciate that and um you know quick shout out for past shows past episodes friends of the show if you will sana amanath who's sort of the credited um creator of the character yeah, or one, one kamala of the harris i should say yeah kamala harris as a, a kamala Harris Khan. God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Kamala Khan. That version, if you will, that iteration of Miss Marvel is Sana Manath is accredited with it, along with um, yeah, you know, G Willow Wilson. So who I've tried having on the show, but we'll see. But anyway, Sana Manath we had um, several years ago, and of course uh, our our good buddy uh, Azar Osman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's he's, which he's, I think is going to be a character that is going to be developed further. I just have a feeling like they do that, you know, like we, we were talking yeah. off air about Marvel does that where it's like the buddy slash wise, you know. Yeah, they'll find they'll yeah. find these recurring characters right. um, that are just kind of interesting and funny and, right. and likable. Yeah. And they'll bring them back and potentially grow their role over time. That's right. It could be 
um, it could be I, almost like Wong. Wong. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great. He, he started out in a small role mm-hmm. and, and kind of grew. But there's others. There's like right. the, the the in in um, in uh, Wong Division. There's the in, investigative cop. It, right, see, who's actually the guy from, from that, that sitcom? Ant Man. Oh, no, the guy yeah. from the, the yeah, I can't remember. He's an Asian Asian American actor. Yeah, yeah. From he's, he's like, from Ant Man. He's the FBI agent. Is, is he? he? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. yeah, he's the FBI yeah. agent. Yeah. But I agree. So a character like that, but then also can drop you know words of wisdom that mm-hmm. inspire our main our main lead. So who, I, don't, I don't know who knows. Yeah, um, we're hoping. We're hoping <laughs> Disney knows and Uzer knows. Yeah. But uh, and uh, hopefully I don't know. We'll see if I can. Uh, if the stars align, maybe we'll have Uzer back on the show. But but you know, and I'm not sure if we've talked about this. Yeah. Uh, but it's just so. Isn't it also funny how like us older folks, uh, older fo- you know, post uh, at over forty, we're all like, super excited, and our kids are like, "Yeah, that's cool," and yeah, we're like, that's "Oh my point, god, man. that's amazing." They said. They said, uh, you know, uh, dua on the show, and they said That's this right. and that, right? Ayatul Kursi. Uh, yeah, Ayatul Kursi. <laughs> Allah <laughs> Mubarak. Right? Yeah. Um, and we're just like, oh, yeah. my God, that that's amazing. And our kids are like, yeah, that's cool. It's cool that they did that. Yeah, yeah. I know, <laughs> right? take it for granted. It's so right? true, so true. I, I remember as uh, in, like, in 1986-87, they they had on Growing Pains, they had, like, the, the, brown, the brown-skinned shopkeeper with, like, one line, and we were like, super excited yeah. to see that right? right and now it's like a completely different world so true for me i think it was uh it was azim um uh, in uh uh robin hood king of uh oh, right morgan freeman morgan freeman and to me that was like such a positive portrayal of a muslim character but then i cringed when they showed him praying because it was so weird yeah, yeah. in here we get to see the inside of a mosque pretty accurate see, yeah and we get to see an imam who's not a caricature mm-hmm. like he recognizes you know Kamala's concerns. Her friend, I forget her name, but like Nakia. Yeah, right. Yeah. And 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 he was very you know empathetic with mm-hmm. what they were saying and what they were raising. So you know, really, again, subtle, but um, and 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 just nuance. Yeah. See, nuance, and that's all we want, man. So anyway, pretty cool. Um, we'll come back. We'll come back on the show and to, to definitely talk about it when it's all said and done. Um, but speaking of content, we are delighted and excited to welcome um, uh, Mona Haider and Sebastian Robbins to the show, who are actually here to promote an upcoming um, PBS documentary called The Great Muslim American Road Trip. Mona and Sebastian met at the top of a scenic mountain in northern New Mexico. It was the summer of 2011, and Mona had just arrived at the Lama Foundation, which we'll definitely talk about Mm -hmm. on the show, an inter-spiritual retreat center where she was to start an internship. The first person she met there was Sebastian, and as the story goes, they fell in love and married the following summer. In 2015, Mona and Sebastian gained international and media recognition and attention for their Ask a Muslim project, which was a booth offering free donuts in exchange for a dialogue and questions in the wake of the Paris and San Bernardino extremist attacks, Mona, a Muslim, is Syrian American, and Sebastian, convert to Islam after meeting Mona. A few years, a few years later, Mona, who has a master's degree in Christian ethics and is a fierce advocate for civil rights and inclusivity, turned to music. Um, that's where she sort of hit the radar for me. Um, the video for her hip hop anthem "Hijabi" (Wrap My Hijab) went viral in 2017, gaining over eight million views on YouTube, and Billboard named it one of the top 20 protest songs of that year i also remember and something i definitely want to talk to mona about is was another video that dropped around that same time period which was called dog which which interestingly enough talks about this idea of holding leadership accountable and um and uh uh can you know and and spiritual abuse and so on so anyway we are delighted to have mona and um and before yeah and before we before we dive in a quick shout out and thanks to the folks who uh, help make this recording possible uh, that would be Brandy Toby Leon with Bullseye Consulting uh, and Heather Marone, uh, as well as Amina with TIM Consulting. They're the folks who reached out to us and and uh, really requested uh, uh, our you know requests wanted to see if we were uh, interested and able to, to to have the show and have the, these guests on the show. We absolutely took took them up on the on the <laughs> That's offer. Right. And of course, Alex Cronemer and Jawad Abdul Rahman and Daniel Tet with UPF Productions. Uh, who are making producing the show, uh, and of course everybody at PBS uh, for putting the show on air. That's right. So and uh, UPF th- is no stranger to us. I mean, I know they did um, uh, a few documentaries that mm-hmm. I know we we certainly enjoyed in our time. Uh, 
uh, more recently was, I think, Prince of Slaves. They did Prince of Slaves. They did uh, Muhammad Legacy of a Prophet. They did the one about the woman who helped the the Jews of the Holocaust. That's Um, right. I forgot about that. The Iranian woman. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember the, right, the name, but right. um, we'll put a link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic and more. stuff. There's others yeah, too. Yeah. They've done some good work. That's right. That's right. And, and I know. Yeah. So anyway, well, we are delighted. And uh, yeah. So welcome to the show. Welcome, Mona and Sebastian. Welcome to the show. We're super happy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And uh, where exactly are, is home, and where are you joining us from? We are obviously on the West Coast, but I know you are not local. Yeah, we recently re relocated to Michigan. We live in Ann Arbor, Michigan now. I grew up in Flint. We lived all over. We lived in California for a hot second, New Mexico, New York, Marrakesh also for a hot second, and now we're back in Michigan. <laughs> well, nice, nice. Yeah, we, uh, we, we we like to start off with people's origin stories. So, um, you know, while we're still, I guess, geographically in the in the Midwest, I know your roots go back to the Midwest, Mona. Um, and the only reason I know that full disclosure is because Mona and I met at this wonderful Al Hibri Foundation um, uh, workshop, I think a few years ago, a number of years ago. And then of course, uh, name drop, uh, you and a shout out to your brother, Mohammed, who lives here in the <laughs> Bay area. So definitely have to mention his name. Cause I know he's going to probably listen to the show, but I, I don't know anything about that Sebastian. <laughs> so, so now, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know anything about Sebastian. So I definitely want to hear that. So whoever wants to go first. Yeah. Yeah. So Je- Sebastian, are you, are you a Midwester as well? I am not. No, I grew up in Massachusetts, uh, I grew up in Cambridge, Mass, and uh, lived in Massachusetts through high school. And then I left and moved out to California, lived in San Francisco for about 12 years, uh, traveled a lot, lived in New, New Mexico for four years, and that's actually where Mona and I met. Um, I actually went to school here at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor for two years. But I never thought I'd come back to live here. So, <laughs> well, we definitely want to hear about how you met. But yeah. let's maybe rewind even before that, uh, Mona. Maybe you can tell us a little about what it was like growing up in um, in Michigan. I mean, obviously, we hear about the big Muslim community, the big Arab community. I'm I'm headed, and both of us are headed there for a wedding. We're super interested, you know, we're super excited to to check out Dearborn and check out the largest mosque in the U.S. But we'd love to hear about uh, what that was like. Yeah, I was actually born in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, funny enough. My parents emigrated to the U.S. in 71. And then, you know, they were like, these kids need to learn Arabic. So (laughs) we were kind of back and forth um, a few times. And then I was born in 88 in Riyadh. And then my younger sister was born there also. And then the Gulf War happened. So we came right back to Flint where my parents, you know, decided that was the end of the moving back and forth. Um, so Flint as a place to grow up was amazing. It was very, I just feel so grateful and lucky. I know there's a lot of like negative stories about Flint and what it is, but there's also a lot of beauty and richness, um, whether it's the beautiful black history and black culture of Flint, which is something that I got the opportunity to really, um, learn from and grow with as a result of being in the spoken word community Mm -hmm. out there learning from the beautiful vibrant black artists in flint how to use my own voice and then um you know the muslim community really grew my parents were some of the first people to come to flint the first immigrant muslims to come to flint and um they founded the the flint islamic center and it is now massive (laughs) it's an enormous beautiful vibrant community full of people from all over the world. Interesting. It so, really is. So, I, I mean, I, I think back to my days at, in Minna being involved and how many brothers and sisters I knew who grew up in the Flint community. Uh, you know, just, I, you know, people I, I imagine you knew, you grew up with uh, your namesake, uh, you know, the Jindis, uh, Mona Jindi in particular, mm-hmm. um, her husband now, uh, well, of course, her husband for a while, but Jawad Shah, I mean, <laughs> anyone who's been, uh, I guess growing up in the '90s certainly knows that name, and uh, yeah, just again, so many luminaries come out of that come out of that community. Um, I always like to just to make my guests feel like as if I can relate. Uh, I spent a, a, you know about three years of my life in in Michigan, um, not enough to consider myself a Michigander, but certainly be able to drop 
uh, some familiar names and references. Um, and speaking of uh, you in, in the in the East Coast, Sebastian and I didn't have the fortune of living fortunate um, pleasure of living in Boston, but I did live in Springfield, Massachusetts for about a year. So um, right yeah, I've been all over as well. I always say I'm like the army brat without the army part because <laughs> we moved around a lot. Yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, so when you, when you were talking at the outset, Mona, about being here and there as a, as a couple, uh, you know, uh, in terms of um, spending time for a hot minute, uh, that's been my kind of life story. Um, although now California has been home for 12 years. So Anyway, here we are. Uh, but yeah. yeah, Umar, I think had a... Well, both both Barbez and I grew up listening to a lot of music, and that was definitely formative for us. But yeah. um, as as a rapper, did you, what kind of music did you listen to growing up? Or did maybe, you know, tell us a little about that. How did you get into that? I'm, I'm going to call a Zoomer moment on, on, on Umar. Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, Boomer. I'm going to call Umar a Boomer. Totally. By just, <laughs> by, just re- by just calling Mona a rapper, which that itself is such a... <laughs> Such a boomer term. Um, <laughs> Hip hop artist, I think, is the correct terminology. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you don't look old enough to be a boomer, man. That's kind of a low blow. Yeah. Well, I, I, I did in my prep rapper artist. Maybe I should have used that. That's a little more, uh, a, a little more uh, contemporary. Well, you know well, your brother calls me friend? an uncle, uh, Mona. So yeah, he refers to me as Pervez uncle. So you know, I, I think I, I, I mean, obviously, there's some humor in there. Um, but I think at the same time, there is some truth as well. So what, we're probably right up the threshold there, my friend Sebastian, in terms of uh, being uh, being officially boomers. <laughs> sure feels like, like it. it. Sure feels like California like climate's doing you, you guys right. Alhamdulillah. I'm, I'm... 99% sure Sebastian's older than the both of you. So. Put it this way. I'm well not done, I'm not young enough to unabashedly tell people I was born in 1988. Put it that yeah. way, right? I, I'm, so Mona, I'm wondering when that when that when that when that when that mark's going to be where you're not going to be so, you know, uh, you inshallah know may Allah I, always keep you that I'm way like where that. yeah. Uh-huh. I really feel like the older I get, the more proud I am of my age. Go for you it. Know? That's right. I've I've lived like a very public life since I was 14 and performing and, you know, sharing my work on stages. And the older I get, I look back and I'm like, ooh, you know, I wish I didn't share that poem or I wish, I, you know. And so I feel like age is just such a gift. And with it comes so much reflection and I hope growth and yeah. just feeling really grateful for the passage of time, you know, like. That's something I'm like, I don't know. I I feel very, a lot of gratitude to Allah to allow us to experience time in that linear sort of way. Mm -hmm. Profound, deep. Thank you um, for for that. But um, yeah, I mean, I I guess, you know. There was a question about rappers. That's right. (laughs) And and, and, I totally ignore. (laughs) And age 14. You mentioned age 14 as um, the first time you uh, did something in the public eye. Tell us about that experience, what that was. Yeah, it was an open mic in the city of Flint. And, um, you know, I got up to a microphone and I had my poem memorized backwards and forwards. And I got up to the mic and knees shaking, couldn't catch my breath, you know, and literally nothing came out of my mouth. Just silence. I could not speak. It was um, it was so embarrassing. I was so embarrassed because this is a community that had like, people had literally workshopped my poems with me and like spent time and, you know, dedicated a lot of time to me memorizing these poems and learning the like quality of the lyricism and how to like create bars and how to create like jokes and punchlines. And I just got up there and nothing came out of my mouth and it was pretty embarrassing. But, you know, the second time um, I got up to the mic, it was, it was great. And, you know, I kept doing it and, um, I'm still doing it. So, well, I don't know how long (laughs) I'll keep doing it. But, um, yeah, you know, I will say that um, it's had such a huge impact on my life, um, being a part of hip-hop culture. And I feel, like, honored and blessed to be a part of a culture that came out of an intention and a desire for people to to truly learn how to get liberated, how to get free from the shackles of um, modernity, the shackles of capitalism, the shackles of, you know, what it is to be non-white in the world of global empire and white supremacy. Um, So 
you know, that was my kind of introduction, but I did not grow up with music. Um, my family was pretty, pretty strict about that. Um, I grew up with really traditional cultural Syrian Anashid, <laughs> the right. Mauded, um, you know, the deaf. That's as far as it got. <laughs> right. And then, you know, I was so, I was so happy when Native Dean, they were back then, Mina Raps came on the scene and, you know, that was like, what? <laughs> what is that? You know, and then most stuff, Yassine Bay yeah. and, um, in the 90s, I was in Damascus, Syria, and my sister had the Black on Both Sides album. And we were at my grandmother's house in Midan in Sham. And I, I, she let me borrow her Walkman for a, few, for a little bit. I put that CD in, and he starts with Bismillah. And yeah. that was it. It was like, oh, like I'm allowed to exist, <laughs> you know, as like a Muslim here in America. We're, we're here. It's real. You know, I, I'm not this like disembodied form i actually am allowed to have roots i'm allowed to have representation and that was profound for me so that was like 14 years old 13 that was actually 13 in damascus syria so i think that's what kind of gave me permission mm. to, to to like actually go to those open mics and and try yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you dropped so much there. I, I, I want to respond to so much, but at the same time, I want to uh, uncover more story as well. But uh, I, I guess, Sebastian, I mean, you know, how about like your connection, not only perhaps to music or any kind of sort of expressive uh, form of, of art, I guess, and, and your relationship to that. Um, I often avoid asking folks their sort of, you know, the, the, the cringe inducing at times like conversion story, but maybe, you know, like just your relationship to the faith and, and, and sort of your, your upbringing and things like that. To, to any to faith. Yeah, just, yeah, just exactly. Curious. No, no, that's what I, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Pretty yeah. much everything Mona said is true for me. So just ditto <laughs> the whole, the whole experience. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So faith journey. Yeah. Is that what you're I mean, kind of I, I think about? just your origin story. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. general. More just you, just growing up. Just growing yeah. up. Yeah. I went kind of full throttle into the story. You should share yours. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard following Mona. Uh, second, second act here. Oh, come on. Uh, Stuff on <laughs> Bismillah. Well, um, I grew up um, with two very different parents. Alhamdulillah, they really imparted a lot to me and I'm grateful for that. My, my mom, uh, Protestant Christian, very devout and goes to church every week. She sings in the choir. Um, we grew up going to all kinds of different churches um, growing up. Um, and um, her brother-in-law was a Presbyterian minister. Her, her sister was born again Christian and those folks were actually very, very influential in my life, not necessarily in a religious way, but just their kind of depth of character, their sense of service, um, their devotion. I never really resonated with the church experience, except, funny enough, with music. We went to a, a church for a couple of years in Cambridge that had a beautiful choir, and that really had an impact on me. But um, you know, I was never scarred or traumatized by the church, but I also never really found a home there. Um, my dad um, is Jewish and his parents, my grandparents were like my favorite people on the planet. Um, and some of my warmest, safest memories are with my grandma Sylvia and grandpa Abe. Um, they really were part of the generation that um, eschewed religion. You know, they were, um, sort of that World War II post-Holocaust Jewish generation that retained a lot of beautiful cultural Jewish practices. But I think that there were many people in that generation who just kind of understandably lost their faith in God, um, but had a proud sense of Jewish culture and identity and for whatever that meant for them. Um, and so half of my family and most of my cousins, my dad's cousins and are Jewish and there I'm very tight with them. In fact, I spent a lot of my thirties trying to be Jewish. I really wanted to reclaim that part of my identity 
my grandfather changed his name from Rubenstein to Robbins. Um, so I grew up not looking Jewish with a non-Jewish surname without a lot of Jewish identity, but I, there was something in that tradition that called to me the, you know, the bar mitzvah, the coming of age, um, ceremony, um, the, um, the devotional service that involved a lot of singing. I went to uh, uh, this Shabbat service every Friday in San Francisco. It was, a, it was an hour of just singing. And um, again, I think that kind of related to the gospel and the congregational participation. Um, but, you know, for some reason, I couldn't quite find a home there either. I always felt really like an outsider in the Jewish community. And I just couldn't kind of find an anchor, especially I think I was looking for like, something that grounded me on a more regular basis. Going every Friday or going every Sunday had its real beauty. Um, and one of my, my aunt and uncle's godson, who really became a brother to me, we met when we were very young. He converted to Islam when we were in our teens. And we would go backpacking every summer, my brother and he and, my, and myself, my aunt and uncle. And for years, we just peppered him with questions of like, what, what is this journey that you're on? And what is this religion that you're part of? And of course, at that point, you're very obsessed with kind of the rules, you know, what are you allowed to do as a Muslim? The do's and, and don'ts. Not allowed to do, yeah. And that was like, we, you know, just went through like the whole human experience um, with him. And he was very, you know, open and patient. Um, and I think way back then that kind of planted the seed this idea of me for me that Islam A existed and B went beyond these kind of rules and regulations. I didn't know any Muslims at all um, growing up in, you know, very segregated Boston, Massachusetts, you know, again with this Protestant mom and Jewish dad, it just wasn't part of my school experience. It wasn't part of my friend group. It wasn't part of my cultural experience. Um, and, but because my friend Hamza was so close and we saw each other so often, I had this touch point. I visited him. He moved to Morocco where he still lives. And I visited him a number of times there. Um, so Islam was always sort of this kind of house at the top of a hill that I could kind of see and I would sort of walk around, but I couldn't quite find an entry um, until Mona came into my life, alhamdulillah. Um, I had been living two years at a intentional community and retreat center in New Mexico. And I don't know if you want to get into that whole story now, but you know, I kind of, Mona was, I didn't convert because of her and she certainly didn't encourage me, but I feel like she was the person that like handed me. That the, makes it sound so bad. Like I didn't encourage. <laughs> well, you, it, it, you didn't, you yeah, didn't. Yeah, it's true. I didn't. You right. didn't. And I think that actually that was a, um, a benefit, you know, right. I think that was actually something beautiful that you, for me, modeled Islam without any sort of um, enticement or encouragement or anything to, to kind of join your team, you know, it was like, <laughs> I feel like she handed me the key and was like, yeah, you go check that house out, you know, open the gate, walk around and see what it's like. Um, I'm not going to hold your hand, but it's there for you. Yeah. This is open to anybody. I'd love um, to. I'd uh, love to find out from from each of you what um, what brought you to that that retreat, that center, because the, it sounds uh, like that's a pivotal. Well, I and you know, as someone who's been part of conversations around intentional communities, I'm also really fascinated by that idea. So, and and I think for yeah. our listeners who may not be familiar with the ideas uh, or yeah, like the right. like the whole thing about an intentional community, um, I will say just real quick again, Sebastian, like I mean like that story, right? I mean, you're, you're a story, my friend. And, and just, I mean, just having both of you on together, um, is, you know, beautiful, but at the same time, like it just reminds me of wanting or gives me a mental note of wanting to have both of you on individually. Mm -hmm. Um, so, because I think you both have beautiful stories that I would love to spend an entire podcast unpacking, but anyway, I think he's saying I talk too much, so he wants <laughs> no. to have you back when I, I don't interrupt you so much. Not at all. <laughs> I, I was, I'm true. And I was I'm thinking, true. and I was thinking, and I know we'll, we'll talk yeah. about this maybe down towards later in the show, but I know you, you have kids. I was thinking, what a heritage, right? That's You're right. You got the, all the Abrahamic fates covered. Uh, 
yeah. yeah. We'll, we, we'll tell you some stories about our five-year-old in a minute. For sure. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Religious heritage, but I mean, just so much. I mean, mashallah, yeah. that, 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 is, that is beautiful. Yeah. But um, yeah, maybe if you want to, if you're, you know, whatever you're comfortable sharing about the uh, intentional community in New, in New Mexico, yeah. I believe. In New yeah. Mexico, yeah. 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 Uh, which is fascinating for me because... You know, as as I imagine, y'all know, and we'll get to this certainly. Obviously, is talking about the Great American Road Trip, but um, I'm you know, there, there's that community in New Mexico, Al- Albuquerque, where yeah. Darul Islam, which is we've talked yeah. about and mentioned on the show. But anyway, okay. sorry, but yeah, you can always frame it like that if you would like as well, because again, I think some of our listeners are familiar with that community. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll start just because it's a place that's been part of my life, and then Mona can talk about how she was called there. Yeah, Hamza with, was born there and you were just talking about him. Yeah, so I have this long history. So the aunt and uncle that I just talked about, my uh, the uncle who eventually became a Presbyterian minister and his wife, who was my aunt, they moved there uh, in the late 70s. Um, and It's called Lama Foundation. It's called Lama Foundation, yeah. And it was started in the late 60s when a lot of the hippie communes were really blossoming um, and there were a lot of communes actually in New Mexico and in that part of New Mexico that were, were coming up. They came when it was about 10 years old. And already by that time, a lot of the communes had kind of crashed and burned mm. um, with sort of this era of permissiveness and promiscuity and drug use. And one of the things that set Lama apart is they said, you know, you have to be clean and sober here and you have to have fidelity in your relationships. And the story is that when the leader stood up and said that 90% of the people got in their cars and left and went and found something else that was more fun. Um, (laughs) And so that really set Lama apart, Mm -hmm. but I think it also ensured its longevity. It's still going after 55 years, I think in part because they really chose to not go that indulgent kind of permissive route. Um, It was founded by Sheikh Nur al-Din Durki. Yeah. Oh, wow. It was the very first community that he founded. He and his wife at the time, um, Asha Greer, they had this wish, this desire to set up an intentional community where people could come and seek God. They were both seekers in their own traditions. And they wanted a place where people could meditate, where people could pray, where people could seek God. And... um, they founded Lama Foundation. And at that time, um, you know, even the way they went about it, the story, the origin story of the place is so profound and beautiful. They sought permission from the the native elders of the land who didn't own the land at the time, but it was still their land, you know, it's still their land. They sought permission to even buy the land um, from the people who owned it. And, you know, it has a sacred spring that flows right down from the Rocky Mountains. It's this pristine kind of beautiful place and landscape and when you hear like if you ever go there it's just this it really is it's just serene it's just like when you when you hear the the story of the prophet muhammad when he's in the mountain you know when he's on the mountain in and he's just trying to be with his beloved that that was the feeling i got when i got to lama mountain wow um, yeah, I mean, you're giving me the need, you know, like the urge to, to go on a road trip and discover <laughs> these places. No, I mean, I've always wanted to go to the Albuquerque community. Yeah. Um, and, and now you've put another sort of destination on my map. Um, so he then later yeah. went and founded Dar al Islam oh, in Albuquerque. Right. And um, it was after he left Lama Foundation, he had become Muslim. He traveled to Al Quds. He had this transformative experience and he came back and wanted to you know, create that of Islam in America. Mm. And he, they did it for a really good while. And they had a vibrant, thriving community for, for a good long time. Yeah. I am um, like the uh, teacher's Institute that comes, you know, like, like yes. that. And so many people come out of that, of that, yes. uh, of that entire, you know, endeavor. Uh, I think more recently, you know, brother Ali did a music video there, which was amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 certainly a spot, and and you're you're just even what you're touching on is a beautiful not I mean chapters plural of the history of Islam in America. Um, but again, you know, being mindful of the time and, and being mindful of wanting to get to 
the, the like the show on um, and talking about the Muslim American experience, American Muslim experience as we like to frame it, but nonetheless, whatever, um, you know, we don't want to get caught up in vernacular and, and whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess if you could talk about the project and, and what got what interested you when you were approached um, from, um, you know, from the folks at uh, Unity Productions to do the show and, and what that was like, we'd love to hear that story. And, and, and actually, I'd be okay even just putting that, putting talking about one thing just before that is, oh, yeah, is, yeah, is how you met. Because I know oh, yeah, you, sorry. I did I did find that interesting because I know, Mona, you went over there. I, mm-hmm. I read somewhere there's there's a personal event that that um, kind right. of triggered, triggered you to go there. So maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, I experienced a, a personal tragedy here and um, lost, lost a friend. And in that, in that loss, I, I really needed to get out of Flint. I really needed to leave. Um, and I'd heard about Lama Foundation. They had a permaculture, um, a permaculture internship going on at that time. And I was really interested in permaculture. Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah had been talking about Jeff Lawton and, and everything that they're doing out there. And you know, I, I posed it to my mother at the time. I was 23. I posed it to my mom. I said, Mama, I can go to Australia or wherever there that Zaytuna farm is. I forget now. New Zealand, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, but there's this also internship happening in New Mexico that I could go to, you know, like, so you go ahead and choose. That's a <laughs> <That's> great <laughs> That's a great way to frame it. I mean, obviously you were open to, I mean, you know, I'm not saying that you didn't intend, you know, want to go to New New, New Zealand, but it's like, hey, mom, oh, I, I, I think. I absolutely did. Right. I knew it was never going to happen. Right. So I was like, let me get something in there that is like p- possible that has a little potential. <laughs> right. So I ended up, you know, she ended up agreeing. And uh, after that, I made my way to New Mexico. It was actually the day um, before my birthday. It was May 17th. I arrived in Albuquerque and it's a, it's a trip up to, to Llama mountain. It's like four or five hours on a good day. And I got in the shuttle the next morning after spending the night in Albuquerque, which was the day of my birthday. I traveled the distance up towards Llama foundation. Um, and I arrived around the whole time and I got out of the shuttle and I hear this voice, this booming voice called out to me. Hey, do you need any help with your bags? And um, I said no. But I'd never been camping before. I'd never, like, lived off-grid before. I didn't know what it entailed. So I had, like, you know, 17 different pairs of shoes because I didn't know what I was going to be facing. And I had a brand-new tent that had never been used. I had brand-new hiking boots that had never been used, rain boots. I, you know, I had all the all the accoutrements. You had made a trip to REI. No, I'm, I'm joking. I, I had, actually. <laughs> and I had all the things that I had no idea how to use. And it was, like, it was an enormous amount of stuff now that I look back and realize I had no idea what I was thinking. And I was having a hard time getting off the, the bus, the shuttle, And um, I said no, of course, because I'm out up and I'm stubborn. (laughs) And uh, that person just sat there and watched me struggle getting off the bus and off the shuttle. And they did not get up and help me. But I married him anyways. He's he's quite nice now that we've gotten to know each other a little better. Wow. So the very first interaction you had was uh, (laughs) Sebastian. What? I'm just reading I so much in that. that question and just like out me as a jerk. Like, we were flowing. You're talking about like God, spirituality, and now. Yeah. Like, so Sebastian was the very first person I met on the day of my birthday. Um, and it was, you know, we sat on a bench right outside the, the main area. And he kind of gave me the down loan, everything at Llama and walked me around the land a little bit. And then brought out some birthday cake after he found out it was my birthday. And I met the rest of the community at the time. And yeah, that's how we met. That's amazing. I, and I just love the way you framed the whole thing about, you know, um, can I help you with your luggage or baggage? Or I forget. I mean, again, you know, talking with a with, an, with, with this person who uses words in her art, uh, I think uh, there's deep meaning in all of that. Um, yeah, and, and then the person who volunteered himself didn't actually actually help you anyway, and said, "Okay, your you know your baggage is your problem." That, isn't 
that just the truth about the dunya though no there you go help you with your baggage you that's what i mean it. yeah you're the kid and carry it yourself and hopefully you'll make it <laughs> right and yeah and and that's what a good partner is there for right not necessarily to carry all of your baggage but to, but to help it's you where you need to carry that's your own right that's, there, there, there you go you're welcome yeah <laughs> <laughs> to wake you up for Fajr. But they can't pray Fajr for you, right? Boom. Yeah. There you go. Um, but that's amazing. And so um, I guess in, in so that that initial tenure then, or, or stint, how, how long were you there in, the, in that community? So Sebastian had already been living yeah, there right. two years. Right. And then I lived there two years. So for him, it was a full four. And for me, it was a full two. We got married a year later. We had our, our son, Safi, there a year later, and then we left. Mm. He was born and we left. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Yeah, um, yeah, that is, that is it's beautiful. And again, like I said, I mean, you, you, we're, we're just touching on aspects of the story, which I think there's so much more to uncover and to unpack, as we like to say on the show. It's, um, it's probably a good time to fast forward a bit to the, I think it was the Ask a Muslim Project. So what oh, what yeah. what was what in, what was the inspiration be, behind that and uh, and you tell us the, about the inspiration and then the the reception as well yeah yeah that was a really interesting time we had traveled we had left Lama and tried living in a few other places very short term including visiting some other communities Sufi community we were really interested in living life in community and building from our time at Lama. Um, we ended up, um, living with my mom who lives south of Boston. Um, actually we lived with, with Mona's mom for about six months. And then we lived with my mom. So we had this very kind of micro community living mm. kind of intergenerationally with us and our son and Mona's mom. And then my mom, we were living with my mom and it was, uh, late winter, 2015, very kind of dark, gloomy, rainy kind of climactic time, um, but also globally a very dark time. This was right when Donald Trump was sort of asserting his rise and his rhetoric was beginning. And there were two very violent attacks that happened, one at the Paris nice nightclub and one in San Bernardino, that mm. happened right back. And I think for me as a relatively new Muslim and new practitioner, um, those events hit me personally, probably more than any other global event in my life um, and hit us collectively, I think, just because of where we were living and, and when it happened and having a young son and all the blame that was happening towards the Muslim community at that time. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably the first time that a global event had this resonance and um, that had this feeling like, boy, we need to respond in, in some way. We need to do something. And it wasn't obvious right away what to do. Um, but I do, I do have to give credit to this one Iraqi American guy who was on This American Life. And he did a project years before called Ask an Iraqi. And it was in the buildup to the um, Iraq war. And he went around the country with this big sign and a little booth that just said, Ask an Iraqi. And I just thought that was such a beautiful, bold project. He was on the beach in Florida during spring break and he went to Oklahoma. He traveled all over. Anyway, that story kind of had been tumbling in my mind for years. And I thought, let's do something similar. Like I'm getting more comfortable with my identity as a Muslim convert. I feel this call to do something. Um, let's go out onto the streets with a sign that says, ask a Muslim and just try to engage with people. And it was less this sort of activist right. impulse to go change people's minds and almost more this personal need to connect with the world because I felt at that time, for the first time in my life as a straight, college-educated white man, I felt fear. And I'd never really felt that before. I felt fear for Mona going out by herself. I felt fear when we went out together. I felt fear for my son. And it was a new experience. And that is an experience that is not new for many people who are not white and not male and, and all these things. And I felt like I needed to connect with people because the isolation that we were feeling was quite crushing. 
So we painted these signs and they sat in my mom's house for about a week, kind of just right there in front of her fireplace. And every day she was sort of looked at us like, what are you guys thinking? And what are you guys doing? Um, and uh, I don't know, Mon, if you want to share what you were thinking at that time. I mean, everybody already knows I'm Muslim. So it wasn't, <laughs> like, I walk around with the Ask the Muslim sign on my head every day. Um, so for me, it wasn't like novel, you know, and <laughs> but maybe not the ask part. Right. So I think that invitation is what, well, is what... I mean, white people sometimes are just like, <laughs> They don't need an invitation. They don't need an invitation. That's right. They just go for it. Um, yeah, like I, I have so many stories of people like trying to touch me and touch my hijab and, you know, oh, wow. like be like, oh, can I feel your scarf? It feels, uh, wow, it's so soft. Like I did not I'd say yes. <laughs> like, why are you touching me? This is inappropriate. Um, you know, is this silk? What is, what fat, what is this fabric? <laughs> like, please stop touching me. You should write a story um, about that. It's it's been done. Oh. Solange did it. It's called "Don't Touch My Hair." Don't touch my hair. Then. Talk about my hijab, actually. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, but um, you know, so for me, it was like I don't want to do this. This is this is dangerous. I am not interested in in putting myself in a position where, you know, a crazy person can just come up and make me into some kind of weird hate crime statistic. Mm. I'm not interested. And so I was supportive. I was like, okay white husband, you are more than free and welcome to do this. So a lot of the time I actually wasn't at the booth. I actually didn't like, mm -hmm. you, we weren't there together a lot. Also because we had a, a tiny child who, you know, it was cold. It, it was, was winter December in Boston. So it was also, yeah. it was pretty cold. So we would go, we, we did it at the library um, in Cambridge. And so we would go in and read books and play with the Legos and Sebastian would be outside. And the funny thing that actually came of it for me was Sebastian's experience where he'd be at the booth and people would be like, well, where's the Muslim at? You know, I want to talk to a Muslim and he'd be like, it's me. And they'd be like, no, it's not. <laughs> like for me, that was just such an indication of fear of brown and black people right. and how that permeates the the root of Islamophobia, how white supremacy is really the root of Islamophobia, you know, and we can talk about, you know, we can talk about empire and colonialism and the Greeks and the Romans and where the idea of a barbarian comes from, a non-citizen, you know, somebody mm. who's, who will not be permitted entry into society because of you know, who they are, what city they come from, what they look like, what they talk like, what their food smells like. These are all things that are historically documented. Yeah. You know, for instance, like the Persians were too pale, you know, to be to be admitted into Greek society. And then, you know, um, others were, were too dark and, you know, described as having dog faces. And, you know, so like, for me, it was just like, oh, this is actually like, really steeped not just in xenophobia but in a, in a real way in in deep empire racism and in in, in in citizenship yeah. you know who is permitted to be a citizen of empire so yeah that was that was kind of my takeaway from the ask a muslim project but the interesting thing was that i posted it on my facebook and I didn't, I didn't like necessarily have a following at the time. You know, I had a few, a few people who liked my poetry and followed me for that reason, but it wasn't that it wasn't anything, you know, um, it was small potatoes. And, um, when I posted it, it kind of went viral and we got all these calls, like all of a sudden, Hey, do you want to be on NPR? Do you want to, you, do you want to talk to us? Do and School. right do you want to come to our school do you want to come to our university um the boston globe cnn you know what was the, the npr one i don't remember but it was like shocking you know like we're just and out we here were trying to dissuade these reporters we're like i don't this isn't newsworthy there's no story here we're literally giving out dunkin donuts coffee and donuts and just talking to people like can you find a better story? Kind of like, we just really didn't think it was remarkable. Um, like there's no angle here. We're just talking to people. And, and for some reason that 
I think people were hungry. I think everybody was feeling a little bit of this dark cloud brewing yeah. at the time. Um, yeah. Getting this is the beginning of 2016. Um, and now looking back, we kind of know what that led to, but also that's, I just sort of felt this blanket of doom and dread kind of worldwide. And I think people were hungry for connection, for dialogue. And that's, that was our motivation. We weren't out. And in fact, we even told people, we don't necessarily want to talk about Islam. We don't want to talk about rules. Like we you don't, don't have to ask me anything about Islam. Right. Like we I'm also to... just like a person. Right. That, I go. really like Star Trek. You know, like you could talk to me about Star Trek. <laughs> like... We 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 brought our dog. We brought my mom's dog with us, which was really a great icebreaker. Um, I did it in front of the Cambridge Public Library because I wanted it to appear that this was a sanctioned event by the library. <laughs> that nice. Give us a little bit of cover, even though the library had nothing to do with it. They ended up liking it, sort of supporting us. We'd give them donuts. But we really just wanted to talk to people and we didn't care about what. So I think it it, it fulfilled this uh, void that, um, not that it's gone now, but that was really present of disconnection, of, of lack of communication, of lack of dialogue. And I think, you know, that's all we really wanted to do. Um, and uh, alhamdulillah, you know, it, it, it it, I think it sparked a lot of other people doing similar events. In fact, there was a community that did it soon after in San Bernardino in a mall. There were people that were going to these, you know, there was uh, the Muslims for Trump going to these Trump rallies and trying to engage people in kind of a satirical way, um, you know, and I think there was, uh, yeah, anyway, I don't need to say anything more about that. Well, well, that, def that was, yeah, yeah, well, def definitely um, that that time period, there was that, dark cloud that started forming uh yeah. and then and 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 if if you weren't if you weren't on the side of the, the trump side or whatever you want to call it then your your reaction to that dark cloud was to to mm -hmm. have to reach to reach out connect mm -hmm. uh, and so in some ways you could you could call it the silver lining yeah mm -hmm. you're right it, it like what it, what it prompts people to do in response right in terms of like putting your like you putting your story your voices out there um you know uh, it's it's been said like the 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 religion to religion and religious expression is not so much oppression as much as it is you know apathy and just people mm -hmm. not caring right and so mm -hmm. at least being able to you know regard you know again not by no means you know the kind of scenario you want to be in but nonetheless that prompted this response this you know this this feeling of wanting to put your voice out there so I, I think that's amazing. Um, Let's let's yeah. dive into one more thing, and then we'll talk about the show, and that is uh, <laughs> Mona's uh, music. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's where you first come on the scene for me, like as in terms of like the radar. Um, Mona, I was I wasn't familiar with the Ask Muslim Project, and but but it's certainly your music videos. Um, I, you know, um, especially Dog, but we'll, I want to talk about that in particular. <laughs> but but let's yeah lo, yeah I guess if you want to respond to to, to Umar's more sort of general question about yeah how that blossomed because you're a mom I mean and, and how do you have you know how do you like multitask yeah because it's 2017 right I think a hijabi comes out wrap my hijab com, comes out in like 2017 hits the Billboard charts I mean mashallah so like I, yeah I'd love to kind of again hear that obviously we'll have to do it a sort of abridged condensed version but nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of started as a result of the Ask a Muslim stuff where I was like, yeah, I really need to challenge myself in a way as an artist and push myself to my limit if I possibly can reach more people to tell these truths, my truths, to tell a story in a more impactful way. You know, I was very comfortable in spoken word and I I felt like... I wasn't doing my absolute best, you know, if I just stayed comfortable in that space. And I prayed istikhara. I prayed a lot, um, you know, growing up being taught that music was haram, that, um, you know, that really had a, a significant impact on me. And I didn't go into this thing lightly. You know, I, I definitely was uh, trepidatious about moving into the music space. And when I did it, um, I was actually in Spain and I was sitting with Dr. Ahmad and I was like, can I just play you some of my, my, my music that I've recorded? Can you just tell me if I should not do this, <laughs> please? 
And he was like, let me hear it. And I played it for him. And he was like, oh, you have to, you have to put this out. But say Bismillah and just pray istikhara and see what happens. And um, <laughs> funny you mentioned the song Dog because I played that for him. And <laughs> he was like, you know, you will be doing a service to the community. Even if people don't like it, you will be doing a service to the community by opening up this conversation in That's a bigger right. way. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't know if I should publicly say this, but he said, you know, I, if, if it were in my hands, I, you know, I, he did this. He, he, yeah. I would, to those men, you know, mm. like he, he would like, yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I won't almost describe the hand gesture you're doing, but it's 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 it just reminds me of when we actually recorded the podcast with Dr. Omer. He's such an expressive speaker, and mm -hmm. and and but it's it, it was again audio only, so trying to capture those, you know, yeah. again the nonverbal, um, expressive nature of someone, especially you someone. Describe it. People's imaginations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Strength. He he, yeah. he would like to you know physically. Yeah restrain those men, you know, show his displeasure to, yeah. to them physically. And his name is Omar, you know? And it really reminded me of Sayyidina Omar Khattab, like that strength of, of dignity and honor and upholding ethics and morals and protecting women. You know, you want to talk about uh, like that is what Qawamun means. Yeah. Standing up for women literally comes from the words like to stand. I am to stand up for women, to stand against injustice towards women, to to not stand for oppression. And, you know, we still live in a culture, unfortunately, where we are burying our women. We are burying our daughters. Um, the Prophet Muhammad came to abolish that practice. And, and here we are holding on to it. When our daughters come forward and tell us this man is trash and he hurt me in this way and we tell them you know don't talk to anybody about that that's our secret we don't want to stir you know any ill in the community you know we don't want to backbite we don't want to gossip we don't want to like and and the reality is we're burying our women in in those secrets and and it's haram it's it, it is what it is. It's haram. Even if it's not a physical barrier, it's a spiritual barrier. It's putting distance between them and God. It's not giving them the rights they are owed to be free, um, and to be healed and to be connected to the divine by being in community in safe community. And you know, it's it's something for me that I'm just very passionate about. I worked as a chaplain for a brief period while I was doing my undergraduate work at NYU. And I just, I just can't tell you the number of women who have this experience, you know, um, and it's, it's sickening. It's something that, you know, if we don't feel sickened by it to the point of us doing something about it, protecting our girls, our daughters, our children, yeah. regardless of their gender from these predators, then we have no honor. Mm -hmm. Then we can't call ourselves Muslims. You know, this is like basic, you know, protect the children, protect the babies, protect the women. This is like basic humanity. And um, yeah, I know a lot of people didn't like the song. I know a lot of people felt like I went about it in the wrong way. But hey, like you feel that way, go go do it in your own way. You know, like you are free to talk about it in a way that 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 is positive and in a way that you feel is correct and right. Um, and I, I want people to do it. I want people to go out and, and do whatever they have in their heart to bring more light and goodness and healing yeah. to our community. And that was just maybe, maybe my misguided way, you know, a low Adam, I, I will, I will meet my Lord just like everybody else. And, right. you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm okay with, um, inshallah, I'm, I'm okay with meeting my Lord because I know that I am doing my best and I yeah. do repent when I fall short and, and I pray that I continue to be, um, repentant because that we know that that draws us nearer to Allah. So that's something for me that I, I don't feel like a failure if I did make a mistake in the way that I did that. Um, Can I share something that you said at the time? 
because again, this was 2017. Right. Um, we all know what was going on then. And I remember saying to Mona, like, look, why, why do you want to do anything that would bring any kind of negative attention to the Muslim community? You know, don't you want to just highlight the successes and, yeah. and celebrate the wins? And, you know, why, why are you going to talk about predatory men in the Muslim community? We, we need all the kind of positive stories and, you know, that sort of yeah. redeemer impulse. And she said, look, we, we can't live that way, you know? We we are humans. <laughs> we are people. The women in the Muslim community are like the women in every other community. We've had beautiful successes and we've also been preyed upon. And if we want to be seen as full human beings and and connect with other people and and elicit compassionate response, we have to be honest about who we are. And I thought that response was so beautiful. We have successes like everybody else. We have failures like everybody else. We have victims. We've had. We've had. Not interested in perfection. Al Kamalu Lillah. I'm not interested in my model the minority. Of and, yeah. and, and, and I think there's a tremendous pressure that I, I again, because of my background, wasn't really cognizant of, of mm. constantly needing to put a face out into the world of excellence, mm. of success, of academic success and monetary success and family success. And that's a little bit of what Mona was just alluding to, that we don't want to show any cracks. Right. In our best. We don't want to show any faults in our community. And what, is that, what does that lead to? Well, that just leads to shame and silence. And I just thought her response to my kind of concern, like, don't, don't tell anybody, you know, don't, don't reveal that we, we already have enough people who hate us was like, no, this is the way we're actually going to build coalitions between religions, among right. women of the world, by right. being human. And it's interesting the way that that song pigeonholed me as like an anti-man person, <laughs> like a man-hater. Down like with patriarchy. A, yeah. a raging <laughs> feminist, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting because like, I'm actually not anti-patriarchy. I think if patriarchy functioned in the way of like, in the prophetic model at least, mm -hmm. I, I'm 100% here for that, you know not anti-polygamy i'm not anti-patriarchy i'm not anti any of those things i'm anti-oppression man right. like that's right. the path of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is what we are here to establish on this earth yeah is justice to the to the to the most exponential degree as possible as we are capable of you know that is our role as khulafa on this beautiful planet is to have balance and harmony not to oppress and create injustice you know so it's it's really funny that that's kind of like what i'm known for it's kind of funny that that's the song well, you want to talk about i'd love to hear your thoughts <laughs> oh yeah well i mean i have so many but uh, we don't have time for to, to, to get into all of it um and again it just sort of it, to me it underscores the need to have you guys back on on the show at some point but um but i it, 2017, at that time, I think conversations around predatory behavior among Muslims, among Muslim men in particular, among Muslim religious leadership in particular, was, I mean, people weren't having that conversation. People didn't, you know, either, and not to say that it didn't occur, it certainly did. And there were, obviously, there were instances that needed to be, that needed to have a voice, but they didn't have a voice. And so for, I mean, for me, that sh like just you putting or starting that conversation in a way, um, you know, it's like a jadia because I think like it it it, it prompted or not not prompted but I well no in a way it, it it prompted not only a conversation but more importantly, I think victims actual victims of the of of, of the receiving end of predatory um, you know behavior to come out and to and to and to voice the uh, you know voice their oppression and what they had faced uh, because again I think now we live in a time where every couple of years something comes up it's one you know sort of salacious uh you know uh breaking story from another i mean i think I, you know i i don't want to situate us right now but i mean we're right now there, there's you know conversations around what happened in a particular muslim community and 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 we could you know it's not necessarily or exclusively related to predatory behavior um but it, you know conversations around spiritual abuse we've had those conversations on the show um but I mean, as, 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 as someone who's been involved in the Muslim community for as long as, you know, as we have, as I have, um, you know, 2017 really, I think to me, marked that 
that that that that that that that attention that was much needed around these conversations. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I can't even imagine all that you you went and and felt just putting your voice out there and putting yourself out there, really, as being someone who was starting that or having that conversation. But um, I mean, I have nothing but. I, I mean, I want to commend you on that because, like I said, I think it it, it prompted not only a conversation, um, it it also you know prompted people for having the courage to come out and say, yeah, this is what's going on, and 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 I was actually a victim. So, so yeah, I mean, kudos. Um, I wish I could say more, but like I said, I think I think again for the sake of time, um, I, I do want to talk about the show because I think um, you know a lot of our listeners are going to be excited to hear about that project when they can watch it, et cetera. I, I know I am just eager to, to sit and watch it with my family. So um, talk to us about the uh, upcoming uh, PBS show. Um, yeah, so, what was the genesis yeah. and uh, the idea? And then obviously what, your experience. The, the experience making it and, of course, uh, what, you know when, when we can watch it. <laughs> yeah, we're just arguing about <laughs> who's going to go first. He wants me to go first. <laughs> um, we were really excited about this idea that, um, you know, the organization UPF brought forward and we're just fans of what UPF has done in the past. And we were excited about this idea they had. And when they reached out, you know, it was kind of year and a half into the pandemic and we were just like, yeah, we'll take a road trip. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, 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 awesome. you, and UPF, just for our listeners, that's the uh, Michael Wolf's organization. Is that correct? They did the Michael Muhammad... Wolf and Al- Alex Cronenberg. Yeah. Right. They mm-hmm. did yeah. Muhammad Legacy of a Prophet about 20 years ago, right? Exactly. Yeah. In fact, it's funny. I, I, I was I, I was there for the premiere. It, it was actually uh, held at um, – the Ford Theater, I want to say in Dearborn, and this oh, is yeah. 2000. Yeah, this is way back in 2000. What three, four? Uh, I was living in Michigan at the time, so I was able to attend that, and they were they were, they were both there. But I'm um, I'm sorry. Uh, go please go ahead. Yeah, and and we were just excited to take a, a road trip, and <laughs> right. you know we've traveled across the country multiple times, having lived out in California. We've driven um, all the way from California to New York multiple times because. Wow. You know, we have family in California and we lived actually just north of Mendocino County um, for a little bit. And then we would drive to New York to visit Sebastian's family in Brooklyn. And so it wasn't like new territory for us, but we'd never like spent time in the heartland. We'd always just been like, all right, got to get through these parts. And, (laughs) you know, hopefully. um, So called. Any of those trips. Without kids, right? uh, that too, right? Uh, so being yeah. cooped up a, a year and a half into the pandemic, like you said, with kids, homeschooling, I imagine, right? Virtual, yeah. so yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and we were living in New Mexico at the time, okay. You know, and we didn't have any family around, so it was like it was it was really the wild wild west out there. <laughs> we were alone, and um, we were just like, okay, sounds great. And you know, for us, it was it was almost like a second honeymoon in a way. Where we got to spend time together and and see some beautiful things as a couple and we we hadn't done that since i think we got we first got married <laughs> so it was sweet you know and and we made we started in chicago and we made stops all along the way and we ended in in los angeles at the end of route 66 and you know one thing i'll say is all these different stops along the way but one thing people might not know is that six six is the numerical value of Allah? So I was like, "Oh, really? This is this is a trip right here. Right. <laughs> oh, wow, inward and outward." Monet does not talk about that part on the show. No, so, this so is just on like the journey to the Allah. Here. <laughs> real, oh, that's... And real quick, so just even um, kind of rewinding. So they came to you with an idea uh, to travel and 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 kind of document life uh, of Muslims on this journey is that right yeah what was the sort of pitch right yeah well, yeah, what was, yeah what was the pitch so of the would, show yeah so the idea is mona and i are, are taking this journey um and we are um you know, like mona said kind of taking the second honeymoon and traveling the country on historic route 66 from its origin which is in downtown chicago all the way to california and so one part of the story is you know this couple taking a trip 
reconnecting after, you know, being cooped up and, and, and all these things post or mid COVID really. Um, but really that journey and our story, story and our story is a foil for something much bigger. The show is not about us per se. We're kind of these, we're the hosts, right? Yeah. And so the idea is we're encountering and meeting all these fascinating Muslim Americans on the way and uncovering stories in the heartland. You know, we drive through rural Illinois, which is really kind of the northern part of the south. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Um, we drive through Missouri. We drive through Oklahoma before we get out into the Southwest. Right. And, and the panhandle of Texas, we go through Amarillo yep. before heading into the Southwest and, and California. And finding these communities, um, and this is not kind of a, a, a celebrity um, tour. We, we're not meeting Muslim celebrities who, you know, we're not meeting Ifti Hash Muhammad and Rami Malik and Rami Yusuf and Dua Lipa, you know, that's not the point of the show. We met the, the daughter of, of Muhammad Ali, Mariam Ali in Chicago on day one, and she's amazing. Right. But really it's sort of uncovering the stories of everyday Muslims, um, some of whom are extraordinary and some of whom are un, unsung. Um, in, you know, I call them extraordinary people in unlikely places, Las Vegas, Nevada, for example, Joplin, Missouri, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and it was sort of a, unintentional, but um, it sort of ended up being almost like a, a, a roving talk to a Muslim uh, experience. Yeah. Um, but we, we get to kind of turn the mics and, and interview people and, and talk to folks. Um, and so that was kind of the idea on this very iconic American highway that we associate with like white folks and French fries and Coca-Cola and Hank Williams, you know, and 1950s <laughs> cars and Elvis Presley. Right? Or, or if you're a, if you're, you know, a Pixar fan, maybe with the, with cars. <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> right. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, and you think the South, that's right. I was going to say, white. right. Americana. I mean, the grapes of wrath, right. I mean, yeah. and that whole story, yeah. the, the migrants from the Dust Bowl of the Midwest to the West Coast yeah. in seek of work, in seek right. of, uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, just metaphorically, I mean, the like Route 66 means so much to so many people. But like you said, I mean, it's it's, it's as Americana as you get. Um, and, and the idea of a traveler journey, we can certainly talk about the what that means in our right. own faith tradition. Yes. But yes. Um, and and I, I love what you said, right? It's the it's the, it's the doctor in the small town, right? It's the it's the it's the you know uh, small business owner in yes. you know in in nowhere America or whatever yes. flyover America. So so really fascinating. Um, and so how many um, I guess how many episodes then come out of that? Like I guess how many? Yeah. Uh, how are they? How are they sort of putting that all together? Right? Because yeah. again, that's a tremendous journey. I imagine you could go on. We, it was a three and a half week journey. Okay. Um, basically, we just, every day we're traveling. It, uh, so they put together three one hour episodes. Okay. So it's sort of a mini, a mini series. And the, the episodes within the episode have an arc and the whole thing has this arc, this sort of journey, this journey metaphor. Um, and yeah, the traveling piece was very profound, you know, and again, both Islamically, but also personally, right. spiritually, and metaphorically. Um, and that really comes out in the show when you see, you know, I mean, I think you like, you know, talking about the heartland in Americana, you can say to people a million times, oh, Muslims are just part of the Amer American landscapes. Muslims are as American as anybody else. You know, yeah. we say that some people might believe it intellectually. Um, but I think for Mona and I, who we think we are smart, we think we know some things and we believe this and we even have personal experience personal experience of it. Um, but to go through St. Louis, Missouri and go to this um, restaurant owned by a Bosnian family that was there during the here during the war, welcoming refugees that built this restaurant mm. and telling us their story. You know, no one's heard of these people. These people are not famous. This, this is not a stop on like Anthony Bourdain's tour. Um, should be. It should be. Should. And, Allah and, but it, it, these people were amazing, you know, and their story was beautiful. And um, you know, I think you can't come away from an experience like that with a belief anything other than like, of course, of course, this is the story. Because you talk about the, the Dust Bowl and the migrants, 
who were these migrants? These were poor white folks. That's right. These are these are these the are the Jodes, right? Incredible. I mean, I go back to Grapes of Wrath as a, as a you know, right? So yeah, yeah. like it's but the these Jodes. Are, these are white American yeah. kind of internally displaced displaced people, and that's who gets the attention. That's who gets to be the subject of the, one of the most famous American novels. Not all these other refugees that's and migrants right. that are part of our landscape today. And so I think hopefully it'll shine some light on on that. Um, yeah. And uh, I'll let Mona talk a little bit about her experience and highlights. I've been chit chatting. <laughs> the road trip was, it was transformative in a lot of ways. Um, you know, like Sebastian said, like I don't necessarily believe in the idea of extraordinary nature of people. I think that everybody has the potential to refine their nafs, you know, and, and just from a Quranic basis, we know that to be true, that when we, when we work out all those, King Sarez Rumi puts it, when you polish the heart, <clears throat> you know, it becomes reflective of, of the divine. And for me, traveling is such a, such a reflection of that journey. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the internal journey that we're all having, you know, we're all seeking and searching and journeying towards something. And when you can identify what the goal ultimately is, there's like a, a deep sigh of relief, <laughs> that sakina that enters your heart. And so this journey for me was in a way reflective of that because you know there there's just always so much happening in the world and if you're constantly consuming news and you know reading what the media cycle is turning out all the time it pulls you away from the reality of like real people <laughs> regular life the mundane the like small things that make us human and it's it's those those tiny seconds those tiny moments where Allah breaks through and breaks into our lives in manifest ways and for me it was like meeting beautiful people along the way where that happened you know we met Mama Nisa in in Las Vegas and she was just this vibrant illuminated soul who was serving her community so beautifully um you would never know there was a muslim community right there right off just just a ways away from the las vegas strip mm -hmm. and here she is like feeding her community fresh fruits and vegetables like basically out of her own pocket every week building housing supporting the community creating jobs for recently released people from the carceral system and you know meeting people like her is just like that was what it was for me it was like those small connections of seeing people living breathing their islam you know emanating their islam not because she wore hijab but because how of how she lived her life and it's really sad because excuse me <clears throat> I'm like actually getting choked up. She actually passed away after we met her. And Allah Hamas, she was just this like, I'm so glad we got to meet her and that people will see her story because it's it's truly beautiful. Um, you know, meeting the Gerbic family, you talked about that a little bit, Sebastian, but the Gerbic family who, you know, they told us their like family story off camera also and Meeting them was just so, so beautiful. They are this family who oriented their entire life, their entire family business around service, around khidma, of serving their Bosnian community. And, you know, it's when your eye meets another eye and your heart meets another heart and you can connect. Like, that for me is what the journey is about. 
Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And and absolutely even more so now after after spending some time with both of you. I'm I'm really looking forward to the show. Yeah, and so I in that vein, well, I I'm also a little I'm 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 curious if the, I just the way you framed it, um were these stories or were these individuals that Unity Productions sort of had sort of like I guess there was some initial research in terms of where you were going to go, the sort of route and, and itinerary, and then who you were going to meet. Um, but I imagine there's also encounters that just probably happened accidentally, right? So it was a combination of both of those? Yeah, it Would was definitely a combination. Okay, okay. Because of the pandemic, you know, we, we had some pretty pretty intense restrictions. I, I struggle with um, autoimmune disease, and so we were just trying to be as cautious as possible around you know covid and and all of that um so it was definitely a mix we had to have some intentional things and then it was a mix of like the people who showed up and were there yeah yeah um so really looking forward to watching it um and so where can people or when are people going to have the opportunity to watch it i don't know if that's something that you're privy to but uh, we're, we're definitely curious it's going to be, you're going to have to check your local PBS listings okay. for us. It will be, uh, the first episode will be July 5th at 7 Eastern. Um, but I think, yeah, people will have to check their local PBS channel and station to see the the three episodes and when they will air for you. Excellent. Not far off, just a few weeks away. Inshallah. Yeah. And, and, you, and you know how the summertime goes. So yeah, really looking forward to that. Um, I guess, you know, another thing we often like to ask our, our, our guests and um, in addition to thanking them, obviously, but uh, is, is to where can people find you? Where can people engage both of you? I guess any upcoming projects that you want to or tease or mention explicitly, we'd love to hear that as well. You can find me at a coffee shop. (laughs) That's that's my social media. uh, Excellent. Uh, But yeah, I mean, I mean, jokes aside, I I definitely want to make that coffee happen because I mean, like I said, like, or, or Omar mentioned, we're we're going to be attending our nieces, um, Walima in, in July. And so I'm looking forward to it. And I'm actually Uh doing, I'm doing something, speaking of journey, I'm doing something as having lived in Michigan for three years, we, we never did, which is, we're going to actually ch- we're going to actually journey through Michigan. We're going to go all the way up to the UP, the Upper Peninsula, Mackinac Island. I mean, so we're going to there's a lot that we're going to do. Um, and when I say we as in me and my family, I'm spending two weeks in Michigan because we've always wanted to do that journey and we've never been able to do that trip. So really looking forward to it in addition to having coffee in Ann Arbor. <laughs> yeah, but, but well, we look forward to the coffee, but you're going to love Michigan the upper peninsula and just the upper tip of the lower peninsula. Right. It's spectacular. Yeah. Really looking forward to that. And Mona, any other projects you would like to um, give us a hint about? No. (laughs) 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 That is my answer. Yeah. You're just like, yeah, we're living a pretty quiet um, life right now. And I'm always writing. I'm always working on stuff, but. um, And and of course, just uh, promoting the upcoming project, right? Right now yeah. you're doing these, uh, I guess, yeah, like, like tours, uh, media tours. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, you know, like we thank the people who put this together at the outset, but I want to thank you too, in particular as well for taking the time, um, for having us as being one of the stops along the journey of promoting the show and talking about the show. We, we, we're really singularly blessed to, to be that, you know, just to even provide the platform or be the conduit. Um, for that. Um, but yeah, and, and, you know, I want to extend again, the invitation and Mona, you have family here. So, um, you know, if you visit the Bay area, uh, in person, we'd love to not only yeah (laughs) get coffee, but we'll put a microphone in front of you too, though. So, (laughs) (laughs) or, or or I can't promise that I won't be, uh, you know, won't want to be like, like putting the microphone in front of you. So there exactly. So so thank you again, Jessica O'Hare. Best wishes with the, uh, the launch in uh, in early July. And we, we absolutely will be checking it out. Thank Thank you guys. guys. It was really nice to see you again. So nice to meet you. And we look forward to next time. I'm <laughs> <laughs>